A new company wants to beam solar energy from satellites to other satellites. It's really cool technology, but does it make sense from a market point of view? I'm skeptical. This sounds like it could really make a big difference in how we build and operate satellites in orbit, or it could just be a new technology that sounds really cool in theory, but does not take off. I'm talking about Starcatcher Industries announced today. Their plan is to build a constellation of satellites in low Earth orbit and beam solar energy to its customers, to other satellites. So it's like space-based solar power, but instead of beaming it down to Earth, they would be beaming it to other satellites. They would have large solar rays on a constellation of satellites in low Earth orbit at about 1,500 kilometers, so fairly high up for low Earth orbit. They would beam electricity to its customer satellites, however much the customer's request at whatever times they request. Just like here on Earth, you pay for what you use. It sounds really cool in theory as another way of satellite servicing, but does it make sense from a market point of view? Are there actually customers for this technology? According to their website, they would transmit broad spectrum energy compatible with state-of-the-art triple junction solar cells to client satellites solar arrays. So they make sure to emphasize that the satellites that they are beaming to do not need to have any special receiver they don't need to contain any special technology. They don't need to be retrofitted. Any satellite in orbit with solar cells can collect the energy that's being beamed to it. They also say that each power node is designed to service multiple client satellites simultaneously, and the Starcatcher network is sized to service thousands of spacecraft. And it could be the next big thing. In an interview that the CEO, Andrew Rush, gave, I will link it in the description below, he said that this was to ease power constraints. We often talk about swap when we talk about satellites size weight and power and I never know why it's weight it should be mass he said that we've come a long way in addressing the size constraint and the weight constraint of satellites but not the power constraint and that is where he sees that star catcher can come in with easing the power constraints of satellites whether it's for daily operations or whether it's augmenting at times when there's a really power intensive part of a satellite's life or perhaps even extending a satellite's life he also talked about how satellites could ease their cost their initial cost because they don't need to build such elaborate power structures, such large power structures, and such redundancy in their satellites. Starcatcher doesn't have anything in space yet. They plan to conduct ground-based demos by the end of this year and have in-space demos done by December of 2025, which means it's almost guaranteed it's going to be 2026. They also talked about how this is initially starting out in low-Earth orbit, but could be used for other applications. He talked about lunar orbit, especially with that long day-night cycle. And in talking with initial customers, he said that there were other use cases coming up, such as beaming power to recover from an off-nominal situation that a satellite might be in. They've raised $12.25 million in funding, which is you know small for this kind of thing, but it's a good start. And they're hoping to use that funding to hire. So if you're interested, check out their website. I will have it in the description below. They are in Jacksonville, Florida, which is not surprising because Andrew Rush and his co-founder, Michael Snyder, are both from Made in Space, which was bought by Redwire, and Redwire is based in Jacksonville, Florida. I don't know if this is really needed. I don't know how often it's really needed. I can definitely see that there are needs in certain situations, but I don't know if it's enough of a market to sustain this kind of company. I recently did work for a client where they asked me to break down the space to earth market and the space to space market. And as awesome as the space to space market is, it is tiny in comparison to the space to earth market, tiny in terms of scope and tiny in terms of money. When we talk about this kind of technology, we are often talking about space-based solar power, collecting solar energy using satellites and beaming it down, down to earth. And the reason why that technology is overwhelmingly what is discussed when we're talking about this kind of wireless beaming is because that is where the majority of the market is. It would be in augmenting earth systems, in beaming power to remote locations, emergency recovery, and all sorts of situations like that. But despite the fact that there is a large need for additional power on earth, we have not seen space-based solar power take off yet. The concept has been around for decades. We have yet to see it actually be implemented into a commercial product. If solar power beaming to earth is taking as long as it is and has such an uncertain business case, then this is an even harder business case to prove. In some ways, it's simpler because you're not beaming it straight down to earth. You don't have as much energy loss. The customers are more obvious and they're right there. But on the other hand, 
the market is tiny. How many satellites will actually use this technology? And they talk about on their website the projections of the number of satellites that will grow in Earth orbit. And it is tremendous, that is for sure. Starlink, Project Kuiper, OneWeb, I mean, the, the list goes on of potential huge constellations of satellites, but not a single one of these constellations of satellites is planning to use solar beaming as a primary means of collecting energy. It would be absolutely foolish, I think, for a company to say, we are going to rely on this unproven technology with this unproven company to supply our the majority of our electricity. I don't know what conversation Starcatcher has had with SpaceX, for example. SpaceX tends to do things in-house. They tend not to work with other space companies. I don't know if they've had conversations with Amazon's Project Kuiper or any other large constellation out there. But at this point, I would highly doubt that they are having conversations to provide energy for normal operations for any of those constellations. Instead, where I see this initial business case would be augmentation. But how often do you really need to augment? How often do you really need to correct an anomaly or do an orbit transfer or have some kind of intense period of calculation? A lot of times these satellites do actually have their tasks spread out so that they're not burning too much electricity at once. But at other times, a lot of these satellites are collecting more electricity than they need. And so it is definitely a balance. And I just don't know where this company fits into that balance, to that optimization. I have been on some studies, some trade studies. Most of the time, those energy constraints are not in Earth orbit. Most of the time, they are out there beyond the moon, where the sunlight becomes less intense. The case of servicing the moon, that is where I can see this technology really making an impact. Being able to beam electricity from lunar orbit down to the surface of the moon during lunar night. So any kind of energy beaming for electricity and for heat down to the moon, I think that's an excellent business case. But again, a very, very, very tiny market at this point. They also talk about life extension, which could actually be legitimate, but it's probably not going to be those mega constellations. They tend to deorbit the older models and replace them with newer models that have newer technology and newer hardware. The satellites that tend to last in orbit longer are the ones in higher orbit. So that might be another market area where Starcatcher really can catch on is targeting expensive large satellite that are supposed to last for a lot longer than the typical LEO satellite. I have not seen anyone talk about competition in any of the articles or interviews that have been put out so far, and there's very little information so far. The website says, currently there are no ways to augment capabilities or add power to extend emission once in orbit, and that is absolutely not true. There are several ways. They just might be more expensive ways. For example, the International Space Station just a few years ago added rollout solar arrays to augment and increase the power, I think by like 30% on the ISS. Now that was at an immense cost because it required an EVI. On the commercial side of things, on the robotic side of things, we have satellite servicing where they actually attach hardware to your satellite. Northrop Grumman's Space Logistics is a leader in this area. They've got their mission extension vehicle, their mission extension platform, there's space tugs. For example, Impulse Space's orbital transfer vehicle has its own solar panel and can provide augmented power. And as I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of work for decades on space-based solar power. And so there is technology being developed to collect solar energy and beam it down to Earth, which would be the same technology that could beam power to satellites as well. I do want to give props to Starcatcher team for going after this in a commercial direction and not relying on government funding or a government program. I know that DARPA and the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, both of those entities have been awarding contracts to work on this kind of wireless beaming. For example, the DARPA Lunar 10 project awarded a contract to Blue Origin, and Blue Origin worked with a company called Powerlight. I believe they were looking at wireless transmissions on the lunar surface, but the same kind of wireless trans transmissions can be used in lunar orbit as well. So as you can see, there's quite a number of alternatives. They just might be more expensive alternatives. Starcatcher may be the least expensive way to augment your satellite's power our needs. But the technology is yet to be proven. So I'm personally in a wait and see mode to see whether the technology works as intended and, and whether or not it can catch on in a large scale, whether it's scalable. Made in Space was a very innovative company. It's not a huge commercial success at this point, but it proved a technology and it proved a business case on a small scale. And that just might be what Starcatcher does. It can prove the technology and prove the business case on a smaller scale, or maybe I'm completely wrong. And it'll be the main power source for constellations in Earth orbit in, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Let me know what you think about this technology and whether you think that it will catch on. And go ahead and watch this video next about the DARPA Lunar 10 project 
project because I just love talking about new space technology and how we might use it to expand outward into the solar system.